Today on Dirt Lifestyle, I've got Mike from Marlin Crawler here and we're gonna install the new RCLT. Independent front suspension has got a little bit of an image problem in the off-road community and for two big reasons. The first one, of course, is durability. A lot of these systems are sized to be fine on the highway, to be fine on basic dirt roads, but as soon as you put them through the ringer and you go on some really hard trails, they do not seem to last very long. The second issue is flex. A lot of these systems do not have a lot of wheel travel or articulation from the factory, and Marlin Crawler has developed a kit that not only addresses both of these problems, but seems to be a permanent solution. Before we get started, I wanna talk about why you would upgrade to the RCLT in the first place. I mean, yeah, it's a bunch of beefy components and that's great, but is there other advantages? And the short answer is absolutely. So with long travel independent front suspension, what we're trying to do is make it to where we have more travel um, we want to make it to where the arc of travel is a little bit smoother so it doesn't pull that tire back in at the upstroke or back in at the downstroke near as easily. And it's just going to make it an overall much smoother off-road and on-road experience. So pardon my crew drawing here, but we've got an upper A-arm, a lower A-arm. We've got our knuckle and our hub. So I hope you can visualize what I got drawn out here. Um, the arc of travel OEM is going to be a certain amount. And they designed this suspension system back before like 2005. So it's kind of to the older specs. The control arms aren't very long. It's good enough for like the highway, but as soon as you go off road, you will notice very quickly that it's not super smooth. And so with plus 3.5 RCL THD, it's gonna make it to where these control arms are now three and a half inches longer than stock. And this is gonna make it to where this arc is smoothed out. And as you can see, I mean, I just roughly drew it so I can give you an example, but as you can see, it's going to make it to where the space between here and here is much flatter. And it's not gonna be pulling that tire back on the upswing and the downswing of our travel. So now what we're gonna do is we are going to heavily modify the Toyota in order to get it to accept all these big badass parts. And then at the end of the series, we're gonna take it off road and test it. First thing we're gonna do is remove the old steering rack because we're gonna upgrade this unit to a unit from a Land Cruiser. The Land Cruiser rack is bigger and beefier in every measurable way and a very necessary upgrade whenever you're upgrading to bigger tires. Marlin Crawler does not sell a completed rack at this time, but call to see if maybe in the future they start doing that. But right now they include all the things in the kit you need in order to convert a Land Cruiser rack over to a rack that's gonna be able to fit and be fully functional in a modern Tacoma. We need to add a mounting location in order to accommodate the new rack, and there's a jig included in the kit that makes it really easy to line up and figure out exactly or to drill a hole. I'm gonna use a magnetic drill press, but you can do this with any drill, anything cordless. I just wanted to use some cool new tools that I'm playing around with right now. This giant new rack has a spot that we need a clearance, and you can do this with a plasma cutter, you can do it with a cutting torch, but I chose to try and do it with a right angle drill and a hole saw. My hole was slightly off, but with a little bit of massaging from the air hammer, I was able to easily get the clearance we needed in order to fit the rack without any rubbing. The final thing we need to tackle in order to get this rack to fit is to modify the sector shaft. However, on my truck, for whatever reason, there was enough clearance and we didn't have to modify it. But in the kit, there's sleeves and different things included, and so you can modify your sector shaft to fit whatever application it is that you have. For us, the final step of prepping everything for the RCLT installation 
is going to be welding on some beefier brackets to these lower control arms. And to me, this is something that is a must. This is completely optional, but I think it's completely necessary. After straightening out my brackets and tacking in the side plates, I'm going to fit up the lower arms, make sure that everything is square, and then I'm going to tack on the bottom plates, pull the arm, and finish weld everything. Good morning. Yesterday was a long day, but we made a lot of progress. Today, what are we doing, Mike? We're gonna finish up with the frame. All the steering has been finished, and we're going to then throw the MAR rack in, put in the upper and lower control arms, hang the knuckles, put some tires under this bad boy. I cannot wait. So it's gonna be a long day, but if we do it, you see that? It's gonna be a long day in the cold, but by the end of it, this should we should actually be able to see like how wide it's gonna be and what it's gonna look like, and I can't wait. We've got a real tight deadline for this truck. So the plan was divide and conquer. Mike is gonna tackle the first side, installing the RCLT, make sure we don't have any sort of issues or conflicts with my chassis. And then I was gonna double check my front diff, make sure the locker still works because I finally received the fittings I need to test it last night. But unfortunately, the front diff failed the test. It was a cut O-ring and so I had to take apart the diff. And this cost us a lot of time, but I had to fix this before I installed it so we can move forward installing the other side of the RCLT. Take a real quick second and talk about limit straps. Why do you need them? How would you install it in an application like this? So the way they have this kit designed, he already has a tab that he incorporated into this lower arm to make it to where we can mount our limit strap. And then the upper portion of this is a clevis that is adjustable. So this is gonna be super close to what most people are gonna need. Um, and then we're gonna weld this to a spot and then we have some adjustability in the clevis. That's the whole point of the clevis is adjustability. Now, I think a lot of people are confused as to why or when you need a limit strap. Basically, we're trying to protect all this expensive, nice stuff that we just installed here. This rack has a limitation to how far it can go down. The CV has limitations as far as how far down, how much down travel it can have. And then we even have limitations in our brake line. So I'm not gonna put the coilover in yet. Plus later on, we're gonna be doing different fenders and I wanna have this coilover out for that for flex but I don't wanna have the coilover in the way because it's gonna make it too difficult to set all this up. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna slowly droop this. I'm gonna spin the CV. We're gonna see when it starts to bind. We're gonna see when the steering starts to limit out and then we can decide where we need to weld the backside of our limit strap, adjust it out, and then we're done. Here we go. I love this stance. It looks so dang good. Now, clearly, I mean, this is a factory wheel well. <laughs> Trimming is, is required, but 
Um, the good thing is we've got fiberglass that's going to go in here. Um, and once we put the fiberglass in, we'll put the coilover in. We'll be able to actually adjust the permanent ride height. But one of the biggest advantages of the RCLT that you don't see in any other kit is the fact that it moves it forward away from the body, making it so you can fit a bigger tire in here without having to like go into the cab. So how far does it move forward, Mike? Two inches. Two inches. So it moves the suspension forward two inches, which is exactly what I did on my Land Rover whenever I went to a 37, just so I didn't have to like trim way deep into the cab in order to fit a big tire. So now we want to, uh, we want to measure our clearances between the TJ and the Toyota. This doesn't mean anything. It's just, it's just fun. I own both trucks. I want to see which one has better clearance. Clearly this is going to be better, but how much better? All right, let's start with the lowest point of contact. Lowest point would be the diff. We got the diff. It's looking about a foot. About a foot. 12 inches. And then do you want to measure the highest point? Highest point's looking to be 16. 16. So 12 and 16. 12 to the bottom of the diff. I guess we could just measure the bottom of the diff first. That was 12. This is 17 and a half to 18. 17 and a half to 18 to the bottom of the diff. That is considerably higher. <laughs> Skid plate setup you'll be running for an approach clearance is going to be around 20. About 20 to the skid once we get the skid on there. Almost a half. Foot I mean, it's just insane, and it just with smaller tires. There's so much room under there now. Wow. Well, I think that there's a lot of pros and cons to everything in life, and as much as people want to hate on IFS, I think that this is maybe the dawn of a new generation of off-road rigs. The next big thing you're gonna see with the RCLT is gonna be us actually using it. But for now, I wanted to take advantage of having Mike here. He's the person who actually engineered this kit. This is his baby. He's the president of the company. He's the face of the company. So I reached out to you guys on social media. I said, who has questions about the RCLT HD? And uh, like 137 people have already responded in like six hours. So we're gonna hammer through as many of these as we can. And we'll just, we'll just see. I'm sure that there's gonna be a, a mixed bag here. <laughs> so we're gonna do our best to answer them. Let's do it. First question is from Life to Slim. Looks pretty heavy duty. Think they'll make one for the Bronco. Um, no comment. No comment. No comment. There's your answer, Life to Slim. <laughs> Read into that how you'd like to. Next question is from Donnie Knoxville. How much usable travel? I don't know exactly what usable travel means. Is there yeah. unusable travel? That's a really good question. I guess if you have too much travel, it's not it usable. It becomes unusable. Right? Right. Um, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, I think really, I'm gonna save Mike from this one. I think really it needs to be done and I need to actually go flex it before we know how much usable travel there is, right? True, yeah. Because it's sitting on the suspension right now, but until I cut the wheel wells and we know how much up travel we have, how much yep. down travel we have, it's really hard to answer that. So. And just, just to add one thing is that, depending on what you do with your bump stop, you could lob off your bump stop mount, install a hydro ram, uh, a hydro bump, and you could go as high as you want. You could remove your inner fender well uh, walls and just go through the That's whole true. engine compartment. Go super high, high clearance. Yeah. So to be determined, I'll let you know how much my usable travel is once we actually get this thing on all fours and driving, and we'll uh, we'll take it. Maybe we'll find someone with a local RTI ramp or something. We'll go get some actual numbers. Next question is from MGO Train Brain. <laughs> That's a good name. Top three mods to do alongside the RCLT. That is a really good question. Well, I suppose because is that all? Is that we're we just gonna look at this blanket mods? Like, is big tires? Obviously, big tires is one mod, right? Right. Yeah, that's a mod. <laughs> I guess I would I would respond by just claiming that or by stating that RCLT, the point of RC, stands for rock crawling, and so this is truly the first long travel, right? That's the LT, the first long travel designed for rock crawling. So, I guess what mods other than RCLT HD, would one want for rock crawling? So definitely Locker. big tires, lockers, yeah. low transfer case gearing. That Those are definitely going to be... That would the, fall right along with rock crawling. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's probably the top three. Yeah. I mean, it has to be. Next question from S-Cross93. How difficult is the fab work required to install the steering rack? Uh, I can answer that because I just did it. Yeah. It's For a guy like me, it is nothing. For a guy who just has the Costco you know, ratchet set, um, it is not doable, right? So somewhere in between those two lines, if you have a drill, you have the drill bits that are required in order to do the job, which is not, it's not anything. Standard sizes. Yes, it's all stuff you can get at Home quarter. Depot. 100% yep. of the tools Home, required Home Depot. can be got at Home Depot. And then 
I mean, I would say that if you're good with a 110 welder, there's nothing in here that's so thick that this, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yep. For sure someone's already installed it with just a home garage, you know, single phase. Right. 110. So I think that it's the fab work, it's not fab work. The fab work, drilling hole to me is not fab. <laughs> You're not creating anything from scratch. You're gonna just follow the instructions, use the templates and yep. stuff and the jigs that are given to you. And it's pretty dang straightforward in my opinion. If you can drill a hole through steel, yeah. then you can, and, and you can weld up, you know, from under a vehicle, then you can, you've got all the skills required. I'd like to, to add to that is that our rack only requires one frame sleeve for most applications, one frame sleeve to be installed. Whereas an alternate rack is like a narrowed tundra rack that people have been using for, for many years but that's designed to retain all your factory knuckles and steering components and the single ball joints with single shear, which are not strong enough for rock crawling. Well, that Tundra rack has to require two sleeves to be welded in. So you gotta do double the work to install a Tundra rack mm. than you do for a Marlin Crawler Mar rack. And you're not, probably won't get like the template and stuff. That yeah. You, I mean, yours I'm is really sure, straightforward. But, and then we've got a, a third center mount on the Mar rack as well, whereas the Tundra oh, yeah. rack doesn't. That's it's true. stronger. It's all one piece of aluminum. It's a much larger housing. It's just... And so, right, to be clear right now, we're not using that third mount, but it that is available. Yeah. So if we if I do decide to like race this truck one day or something like that, or like one year, then I could prepare for that by yeah. adding a third mount because so, that's something that's available. And our KOH race teams, two of them already have the third mount. So... It'll be soon when we will, we will be releasing that, probably after KOH of this year. Nice. Next comment is from Diesel Flow 21. Is this kit finally going to hit production? I've held out for years, waiting to see if this will ever make it out to the mainstream. And yeah, it's absolutely in production. A bunch of people have been getting them. When was the first kit uh, sent out to, yeah. to someone who bought it? Yep, first kit was shipped April the 2nd. April 2nd. So yep. it's been available for a while. Yeah. Um, and they've just been making them as fast as they can, the quality. As someone who tries to make their best quality, I'm telling you, it takes time to do these things. You don't want to get something that's just tossed in a bag because of time constraints. So they're, they're doing what they can to keep up. Uh, and then there was a comment that I feel like I should address. It was El Taco Diablo 4x4. Get a YouTube channel with a bunch of followers and Big Mike will set you up in no time. Oh, oh, El Taco Diablo. <laughs> you know, it's funny. The, per the perception, some people try to turn everything as negative as they possibly can. And there's nothing negative about this relationship. He sent out tons of kits before I received my kit. I received my kit in like October. They started shipping them out in, in April. April. Um, so it's awesome that I get the opportunity to work with people like him. But it's not like they weren't beating down my door. I was beating down their door to get a hold of this kit. Yep. <laughs> so I'm really happy that uh, we're able to make this work. And uh, don't worry, they, it's not like Nate got moved to the front of the line. I've been talking with him about this since February. I got mine in October, so I had to wait just like everybody else. Uh, but now I do have an advantage. Mike came to my house now. So. <laughs> but so, he, he, he made some coffee for me, so. There you go. We're, so we're worth square. <laughs> <laughs> Next question from Big Timber FPV. Will the unit bearings and all the other stock Yoda parts be strong enough? So in my experience, I've had zero problems. 40 inch tires, these are big hip. My tire is 148 pounds per tire, wheel and tire. And I now have over 40,000 miles of daily driving and rock crawling across six states, driving with the same factory unibearing. And I've never had a single problem. I don't carry a spare. It's never let me down. I wanted to go as big as I can. 40 inch tires is what the biggest tire size RC, uh, RCV warranties for their shafts. And knowing that for me, I do a lot of rock crawling heavy stuff with 40s, if I'm able to get 40,000 miles, which is more than many people even have on their new truck, and I'm doing this with 40s, yeah. On and off road. Stock parts work great. They can be serviced anywhere. You can find these parts anywhere. If you're out in Moab somewhere, if this was some custom unit bearing, you may not be able to find it if you're out in Moab and you break down. You want to be able to just hit the counter, find a Toyota part, and be able to put that on, and that's why we decided to retain these parts. That's the same kind of question I would ask. So I think that's a great question. And, um, you know, it's worth mentioning that unit bearings are, go your experience is going to vary based on your wheel offset, based on what the use is. It's more than just tire size. Yeah. So yeah. Mike, he goes on and off road. So 40,000 miles, that's all in included, which is super impressive. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I think that modern unit bearings are way stronger than they used to be. And if you aren't rock bouncing in Tennessee, you're probably going to get longer life out of your parts. Oh, so yeah. your, your results are going to vary, obviously. 
my results might vary, but I'm actually kind of lucky. I, I have a wider kit, so it's actually gonna be even less stress on my unit bearings. Yeah, with that tire offset. Yeah, with yep. the tire offset. So Wheel offset. it all just depends on, on your setup. Um, now, you, you were talking about other Yoda parts. I'm curious what your response would be. Like, how about, I know a lot of people ask, like, what about the strength mm. of the front diff? So, the great thing about the front diff being a clamshell, and it's a high pinion, and it's a reverse rotation, it's stronger than m many people give it credit for. And the reason is because it's a clamshell, the differential comes together. If you've ever, well, you saw how Nate, if you watched his previous video when he put his ARBs in, the clamshell comes together and the bolts go around it radially this way, which are perpendicular to the pinion coming in. So when the pinion tries to deflect away from the ring gear, it's trying to stretch the housing apart, but it has the added tensile strength of all of those grade 11 Toyota hardware. And um, Carl from Nitro Gear and Axle says he's yet to see a ring and pinion on an on a 8-inch Toyota front IFS, uh, which is 2003 and newer. He's yet to warranty one possible someone could set it up wrong obviously and yeah you know yeah. You, you can break it if you do it you, wrong you can break anything put enough nitrous in it <laughs> yeah but uh, yeah i've never thought about it the front end it just works this thing i've bound it with triple cases 580 to one and i've loaded the motor down and you can feel the suspension going slow and for a uh, engineering standpoint slow speed puts a, ha a lot of stress on your components when you're trying to look for strength S slow will just tear stuff up with that much torque and I've never had a single problem with the front diff. That, I think that uh, clamshells can be strong. I think that they've got a bad reputation from a lot of manufacturers using aluminum cases in their clamshells, mm. and this is not aluminum. This is a lot stronger. So but we'll see. If, if I break or if he breaks, we're open and, books, so you're going to know. And I this mean, is the whole art of the aftermarket. We test it with the really hard stuff. We find people like Nate who get out and use their truck a lot, and then when something fails, great. We work on it and then we provide another product and it's just chasing that weak link. That's what we've done all the years since uh, my dad started in the early 80s. Find what you need, improve it, improve it, and you just move that fuse further up until you reach a point where it's just the ultimate and it'll never fail on you. There we go, I hope that answers your question. Last question is from Wacky Wheeler. I don't have a question about the kit, but would love to know your plans on the rear axle on 38. So are you putting chromoly shafts or keeping the stock ones? So. I'm glad that Mike's here for this because this is the same kind of question I would ask, right? Now, if you look at it component for component, the new Gladiators, a lot of people have pretty good luck with 39s and not having, some people will break the rear shafts, don't get me wrong, but there are a lot of people on 39s that don't and they do wheel them. You're on 40s. Yep. They're both 32 spline, the reason I'm comparing it to the Gladiator, they're both 32 spline axles and um, you ha have yet to have a problem with your rear end. Yeah, never a single problem. It's my factory rear end. Yeah. So. For me, the only things that I hear about these rear axles is that the, they bend, the housings bend. So we're gonna, my plan for this build is I'm gonna build, do, uh, uh, I'm gonna trust the housing and whatnot. And I mean, I'm sure I could source some chromolies eventually, but I would like it to be wider. So more than likely I'm gonna long-term get a different rear end. But for now, I'm just gonna rock what is in there. He's having good luck with it. We wheel very similarly. We both like to go nice and slow up obstacles and, and be choosy <laughs> about our path. And so, um, that's my plan right now. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope we answered a bunch of your questions. If you have any more questions for Mike, I'm sure he'd be happy to maybe go through the comments. And yeah, so, sorry to invite you into my comment world. No, this has some been are, some are going to be good and some are going to be bad, but no. <laughs> welcome. No, this has been great, Brand. <laughs> yeah. It's been a real pleasure. Dude, thanks so much for coming. Can't wait to do some wheeling with you. Yeah. This is going to be a great build, guys. Definitely keep watching what this guy's got in store. You guys are going to be really, really impressed. And be sure to go to KOH and, and meet this guy in person. He's a hell of a guy. So. And you'll be seeing him on the channel. We've got a bunch of plans this year to take the tacos and go crash some parties. It's going to be pretty fun. So oh, yeah. if you enjoyed the video, like, subscribe, all that other stuff. If you want to help support the channel, you can go to thedirtlifestyle.com. We have a link to our Patreon account on there. We've got swag. We've got all kinds of stuff. And if you want to follow me on social media, I'm at Dirt Lifestyle Nate. If you want to follow Mike, he is... Yep, Slowest Tacoma or Marlon Crawler. Slowest Tacoma or Marlon Crawler. See you later.